Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary with the Get Some Podcast. And my guest this week is... <laughs> this motherfucking Gary. <laughs> Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Let's start off with my schedule, if I can get to it. Uh, what just happened? All right. Uh, down there. Okay. Uh, this weekend, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina at the Comedy Zone. That's going to be April 19th to the 21st. Never been to Greenville, South Carolina. It's a cool little city, man. I was there last year. And um, first time I spent more than a day there, but downtown's real cool. It's clean. Uh, a lot of good coffee shops, restaurants. It's cool. Little, it's a it's a cool little town. Never been. Uh, then <clears throat> April twenty sixth to the twenty eighth, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at the Improv. April, I'm sorry, May second, I'm in Inglewood, California, at the Miracle Theater. That's part of the Netflix is a joke festival. Uh, so that's uh, it's Los Angeles, May second. May 3rd through the 5th, I'm in Colleen, Texas at the Twice as Funny Comedy Lounge. May 3rd, I'm sorry, May 10th through the 12th, I'm in Pleasanton, California at Tommy T's. And May 17th to the 19th, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida at the Comedy Zone. May 23rd through the 26th, I'm in Addison, Texas, basically a suburb of Dallas at the Improv. Now, last week I was in Houston. That was two weekends in a row. We did eight shows. So I did 15 total shows. And 15 shows in eight days at the uh, Houston Improv. So I'm tired. But Houston always comes out. So, God, what a great club. What a great city. Uh, glad I moved here. It's just a dope. Houston's just dope. Good restaurants. Vibe's good. They're very welcoming when you come to a city. Uh, found a nice little hidden uh, speakeasy one night, uh, which is cool. Not gonna say where it is because it's a speakeasy. You know what speakeasies are. You gotta find them. I remember there, uh I really like speakeasies. They're always like these hidden bars. You don't know where that. I remember I was in Hawaii last year, and this couple came up to me after my show, and they was like, "Yo, we're going to this speakeasy tonight." And they said you should stop by. And I was like, uh, "Maybe." Where's it at? And they told me. And you know, speakeasies are always like behind a wall or some kind of bookcase you don't know and i remember that my buddies that were with me they was like what's a speakeasy and my opener said it's like poetry the poetry i go no no they don't speakeasy is a hidden bar <laughs> i was like but it, i can see where somebody would think that but yeah i found a dope one this weekend in houston um so oh 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 and just announced i am coming to watch watch, watch how i segue this watch how good this is about to be just announced I'm coming to Buffalo, New York, July 12th and 13th. Let me get this right. At the where am I? The Seneca Niagara Resort and Casino, July 12th and 13th in Buffalo, New York. And when you think of Buffalo, what do you think of? Buffalo Wings, Buffalo Bills, Rick James, O.J. Simpson. Guess who just died? And we all know what I'm talking about. O.J. Simpson. Uh, dude had cancer. Nobody knew. One thing you say about O.J., he can keep some secrets. If nothing else. <laughs> I, it's funny, like, what? I mean, what a complicated and interesting life O.J. Simpson lived. To, to grow up in the Bay Area, go to USC, win the Heisman Trophy, get drafted by the Buffalo Bills, becomes a Hall of Fame running back, at one point held the most yards in a single season. And for a long time, it was basically Jim Brown and O.J. Simpson was who people considered the two greatest running backs of all time. For a long time. And uh, then to, 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 to break into acting... And people forget those Naked Gun movies, man. They were so freaking funny. And then your whole legacy 
is just whew, when obviously the OJ murder trial happened. Whether he did it or not, I don't know if anybody ever know. What I do know, the killer's never been found and not even close. There's never been another suspect. So, whoever that, if it wasn't OJ Simpson, it was the perfect crime by that, by whoever killed Nicole and Ron Goldman. I mean, that was the perfect murder. This, nobody's ever been caught, nobody's ever been accused. It's been OJ, and that's it. So, uh, and I think it's one of those things. There's, there's certain places in history, you knew where you were when it happened. 9/11. I, I'm just speaking from American standpoint. 9/11. Uh, I was waking up, and I was getting ready to get on a flight the next morning to Tampa. And I woke up, and I was like, people start calling and calling, calling. I was asleep. I was on the West Coast when it happened, so it was really early in the morning, and. Everybody's like, turn on TV, and then a couple people was like, you, you good, you good, you good? Because the people that were close to me knew I flew a lot. And, yeah, so I was in California in bed when 9-11 happened. I was in Nashville, Tennessee when Michael Jackson died. I'll never forget that. Uh, but OJ was interesting because that was pre-internet. And, I was, man, I'll never forget June 17th. What a day. The Knicks were playing the Rockets. And that was game five. Was it game? I, I believe it was game five of the NBA Finals. Uh, June. So I, I was. Yeah, June 17th, 1994. Let's see. What was it? I, I'm, I'm almost 90% positive it was game five. Game five. Knicks Rockets. And I know New York fans will never forget this. June 17th. Yeah, it's game five. So I remember I had ACL reconstructive surgery that day. I was in the Navy and I went in and <laughs> I remember I went in, I had my surgery on like like five day notice. I went in, they said, Yeah, your ACL's tore, then and we gotta go in and fix it. So what I remember that day, I was coming out of anesthesia and I was just like, I was slowly coming to and I remember the doc or somebody saying, do you, do you want some more whatever medication they were giving me? And I was like, what time is it? And whatever time it was, 2 o'clock, I go, how long will I be out? And they said, you know, you'd be out like four more hours. I said, no, 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 no. Next, you're playing the Rockets. I want to see the game. And I just remember, like, the doctor busts out laughing. They go, well, the man wants to see the game. And uh, back then, there's no internet. So if you miss the game, you got to wait Till the next day. I remember USA Today used to come out. And I remember running when I was in the military because I didn't have cable. Running to get to the USA Today in the morning. Because there always was a sports section in the top right or left-hand corner. And that, that would be the news for the night. And a lot of times the later games, West Coast games, they wouldn't even report on. Because the paper had to get out. But I was such a Knicks fan because I was such a Patrick Ewing fan back then. And so all I want to do was see the game. And they wheel me in. I'm in recovery. I, they wheel me into the the you know my room, and I'm watching the game, and you know everything's going smooth. And then the Bronco chase happens, and I went, oh, and I thought they were gonna cut in for a minute. All of a sudden, it just kept going, and I said, this this game's over. And then, and I'm and I, I keep in mind, I'm also in and out because I just had surgery, so I'm kind of waking up, going back to bed, wake up, going back to bed. And then I finally get up and nothing. And the hospital had like three channels. It was a Navy hospital. We didn't have ESPN. So I'm trying to figure out the news. I'm falling asleep. And I had to wait till the next morning. I didn't know till the next morning, till I got that USA Today, that the Knicks won. And they won game five. And I thought, it's in the bag. They're up 3-2 and they end up losing in seven games. So that's that was my biggest memory of the OJ thing was that dang Bronco chase that cut out the Knicks and Rockets game. And here's what's crazy. Years later, probably whew, 2001, maybe 2002. I was in, excuse me. It's always been a long week. I was in uh, Miami at the improv in Coconut Grove. OJ comes to the show. 
And I remember they was they was telling me they said OJ's coming to the show tonight. I said, Really? Because I think he was living in he was living in Miami back then. And I remember he showed up with another guy and two white girls. And then the host said, Hey, you mind if we announce you're here? And OJ goes, Yeah, but get, let me give you a signal. Or so him and the host came up with something. He was gonna talk about a certain subject or something. And I didn't understand why. I was like, what's the matter if he's going to announce you or not? So I remember the host, right before he announces my name, he was like, yo, we got a big celebrity in the building. Da, 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 da. OJ Simpson. And that's when I realized people, like, the internet's one thing, but people in real life, there was no booze. The, nobody was like, oh, what the hell's he doing here? Everybody was just like clapping. Some people went nuts. But here's the killer. OJ walked. OJ came to the club with a, with another brother and two white girls. When that host announced his name, he was sitting between two black girls. He moved his seat to sit between two sisters, and literally, I'll never forget it. I mean, he had his arm around them, and they announced his name, and he like waved at the crowd, and they went nuts. And then when I got on stage. I remember seeing him move his seats to go back to the white girls and the brother. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. I said, oh, okay, I see what he did there. Because you got to realize my crowd was mostly black. And so he was like, he probably assessed it when he saw it. And he was like, oh, black crowd. Yeah, let me not let me not sit between two white girls. Let me sit between two black girls. I was like, kind of smooth, I got to admit. So then I don't know how I ever really felt about him. Uh, I don't want to say I was indifferent, but I don't know. I was, I was kind of like intrigued by the whole trial, but I remember I was at the bar after the show and I was sitting there and OJ sits right next to me, starts having a conversation with me. And that's when I realized, Oh, I get it. You get, I always tell people, you don't know till you're in the rooms with these people, why they, they, why they are who they are a la Dave Chappelle. I'm sure it's like that with Donald Trump, uh, Kevin Hart. Uh, I'm trying to think who were, who was like people just being all in the room with them that, that I've been in the room with them and can say, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, I mean, Steve Harvey, uh, Cat Williams, you're kind of in the room with these people. And then you, you get, you get why they, where they're at, where they're at, where they're at in their life. It's just something about them. Their, their personalities are infectious and you kind of almost fall back and just wait on them to talk. And then I've seen it. I've seen it. I've been in the rooms. I've seen how people react. I've seen how people gravitate to him. OJ's had it. Whatever that it is, it, I had it. He had it. And I got to feel it firsthand because he started talking to me and he was like, where are you from, man? And I was like, Cincinnati he goes, oh, man. He rattled off like two games Buffalo played against Cincinnati and how Buffalo was cold, but it wasn't cold like Cincinnati. One of the coldest games they ever played in was against the Bengals. And I was just like, he's talking to me about stand-up. He's talking to me about people we knew. It was just like, I forgot I'm talking to a potential murderer. Like, <laughs> I'm just like, I got so engaged for about five minutes, I forgot who I was talking to. Because one thing about me, you bring up the Cincinnati Bengals, you're going to have a conversation on your hand. And so when he brought up the Bengals and new players, all of a sudden, it was just me talking to a dude about football. I am forget. I'm Take the murder out of it. I am forget I'm talking to an NFL Hall of Famer, Heisman Trophy winner, NFL legend, and I'm just going. And people forget his broadcasting career was, was skyrocketing too when all this happened. I was just like, I completely forgot. He was that engaging. And I was like, and I remember when he walked away, my opener was like, you believe that just happened? I go, that was crazy. And I sat there and I remember just sitting there having a drink going, oh my God, I literally just had like a 20 minute conversation with OJ Simpson and just us two, like no problem. And he initiated. And one thing I did notice, his head was huge. He had a big ass head. I was like, yeah, that's not a normal head. Like my is decently sized, but I can fit that. I bet you OJ needed a head. The two biggest heads I've ever seen in person, Yao Ming, that was the biggest head I've ever seen in my life. I was in awe of how big that dude was and how big that head was. 
And then OJ had a big head. OJ had a monster. Yeah, so that, that's one thing I know is he had a big old head. And then a lot of times when you meet like professional football players, their hands are really big too. And he had he had a, he had a he had a big hand. So, but I mean they take a pound and so yeah that was that was a uh, those were those are my OJ Simpson stories. And I one thing too I will say, his daughter Arnell. God, when I first moved to L.A. late '90s, she was so dang fine. And I remember there was a there was a clothing designer named Dion Scott, and he used to do all the clothes for like the Kings of Comedy and and just all these different people. And I went over there when I first got to LA to get a couple outfits made. Clearly, I shouldn't have. I remember I went over there. This is a funny story. I go over to Dion Scott. This he's just it makes these custom made clothes. And this one everybody used to wear the like two pieces, like the pants were real baggy in the late nineties and. You'd, you'd wear, if you didn't want to wear a suit, you just you, the top would match the bottoms. And he never tucked it in. It was usually untucked. That was a style back then. And so I just remember, I go to Deion Scott, and the guy sold me on, like, something like five outfits for some enormous amount of money, like $8,000, which was, to me, I can't even fathom spending that much on five outfits. He sold me that this was going to, this is the look you got to do, Gary. You on your way. You you just got on BET. And da, da, da. And I remember I wrote him a check. And I go, all right, but don't cash this until payday. And so I went back, and I'm having buyer's remorse immediately. I, I didn't have it like that at all. If he would have cashed that check, uh, I don't think I would have had any more money in the bank. I don't I, – I man, dude hustled me. And then my buddy goes – I get back to San Diego like that same day, and I'm telling my buddy, man, I, I think I, I think I messed up. I bought all these outfits, man. Da, da, da. He goes, man, you got to cancel that check. You got to cancel that check, Gary. You don't need that kind of outfits, not right now. And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, you're funny, dude. Ain't nobody care what you're wearing. You funny. So I had to, I had, I had to call the guy back and be like, hey, man, I canceled the check. I ain't, I ain't getting these outfits. And then he did end up selling me like one outfit on the low. I think it cost me 500 or something, but that was because I was getting ready. That's what it was. I was getting ready to do BET. So he, uh, he made me, a um, an outfit for oh my hour special. That's what I was doing. I got an hour special on BET's comic view. So he made me an outfit for my hour special and, and gave me a deal. I just said, dude, I ain't got it like that. And I, I almost like, I, he was almost like a car salesman. Like I was like, dang, I really almost spent eight thousand dollars on five outfits and only had like eight thousand dollars. Didn't have eight thousand dollars in bank. I was waiting until payday and a couple gigs came through. But who dodged the bullet there? But I, that, that whole story was to tell you one day I was in Dion Scott's clothing um, boutique store and Arnell was in there. And what you know what I remember about that is one time I walked in and they had like Cedric's. Cedric, the entertainer's assistant, walked in, and they had, like, a dry cleaning bag of Dion Scott on the outside. And Cedric's assistant or somebody from the Steve Harvey show was picking up some suits for Cedric. And I just remember seeing the price tag on, on like, the belt and everything going, oh, my God. <laughs> it's so much money. I would have been literally wearing those outfits with, like, a, a, a belt from Kohl's or Target. <laughs> so glad I didn't get it. But Arnell Simpson was in there one day. And I just remember, gosh, she was so fine. And I was like, I'm when I first got to LA, I didn't know a lot of these women. I didn't know a lot of these women were on TV. I didn't know who their dads were or their brothers and stuff. I would just try to get people's numbers and not I wasn't like a sex fiend or anything like that. I just if I saw a pretty girl, I had no problem talking to her. And so I just remember I uh I I was talking to her and I didn't get her number. And then I remember like, man, I hope I see her again. And then next time I saw her, somebody said, you know who that is? I go, no, I saw her at a clothing store. They're like, that's, that's OJ's daughter. I go, shut up. Shut up. And so I didn't, I didn't try to get her number after that. <laughs> but I saw her at Deion Scott's boutique. And then I, I, we, we talked for a little bit. Nothing. And this is like right when some people had cell phones, some people didn't. And then I saw her again at some party. It seems like the when I first got to L.A., the party scene was so dope. But... There wasn't cell phones. There wasn't like the internet like that. So you could actually party and then you might not see people again. But it seems like you would see a lot of the same people again at the right if you're in the right circles. And I was I was hitting all the the A list black Hollywood parties back then. So I was in. I was the one white guy showing up at all the parties. Yeah, so I remember I was 
gonna about to go up and try to get the digits. And then somebody goes, you know that's OJ's daughter, right? I said, okay, I'm gonna fall back. Uh, <laughs> God, those early 90 days, the party scene was, it was just dope. I, uh, uh, side note, we'll get away from OJ for a minute. I remember I met Destiny's Child at, well, this is when there was four of them. This is when it was Beyonce, Kelly, uh, Latoya Luckett, and the other one was it Farah? The other one, um, they were all. I just remember they were all four in the lobby of. It's not the Sofitel. It's right by the Beverly Center. It's always changing his name. It used to have an Asian theme name, but I remember I saw them in the lobby, and I start. I just start talking to them. I saw four girls. I started talking to them, and I remember Wyclef was there, and he he had the what was the what was the the paper that. Everybody had uh, not variety. It was uh, Billboard. The the it used to be the Billboard magazine. It had a paper like paper thing, but it was like it wasn't like the paper like USA Today or local paper was. It was almost kind of kind of silky, almost. And I remember he was reading the Billboard. And he was tell he was showing them how their song was rising. No, 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 no. Then you say yeah, 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 yeah. It was like going up on the charts. And he was showing them, and I remember thinking, "Oh, that's a dude from the Fugees." And then I didn't—I I had no idea who this group was. And I'm talking to him, and I was like, "Oh, okay, okay." And I was like, "Where are you guys from?" Is it Houston? I said, "I'm going to Houston." And I was—I was going there for like a one nighter. Is <laughs> and I got—I got one of their numbers, and I had to write it down on a piece of paper. And I was like, "I'll call you when I come to Houston." And they said, "All right, come to a show." <laughs> Whether. I, it was either, I want to say it was Kelly who I got the number, and whether that number was real or not, but it wasn't like I was trying to, really trying to holler. Maybe I was a little bit. I don't know, but I wasn't really going in. I was more like, oh, no, you're a singing group. I'm a comedian. We're all entertainers. Let me get your digits. <laughs> Never called it. I don't think the gig ever happened in Houston. But, yeah, that was, uh, that was funny. I was so naive to things back then. I was just like, ah, cute girls. I get a number. Maybe I'll call them. Maybe we'll hang out. Same. I mean, I think it's some of the people I ran into early. I remember one time we was at the at the Jerry's Deli was a spot in L.A. when clubs would close in the late '90s, and I had some friends in town. Was it friends? friends? Anyway, I had some people in town that never been to L.A. I remember they they were all like they just want to see celebs. I said, "Listen, it's all you gotta do." I remember it was Grammy weekend, and I said, "We ain't gotta go no parties." We'll go to Jerry's Deli about 1.30 in the morning and about 2, 2.15, that thing's going to be popping with celebs coming in. And it was no joke. I'm talking celeb after celeb after celeb was coming in. And I just remember it was uh, Bono. Was it Bono or Sting? One of them. I, I, I've seen, I saw them both at different times at Jerry's Deli. Sitting there, but this this particular night was one or the other. I can't remember which one, but they were sitting there eating. And Jerry's Dell was kind of like a a lot of a lot of black people went there after the club clo clubs closed because everything closed at two in L.A. And this is what I remember: it was either Bono or Sting. One of them was sitting in a booth with their people, and I didn't see security around them. I didn't see nothing. Uh, but then AJ. From 106 and Park walked in, and he had like this big bodyguard with him. And AJ, AJ from 106 and Park, used to, he would he knows how to work a room. So he's over there shaking hands. What's up, man? We're friendly, you know. Nah, nah. But he had that bodyguard with him at all times. And I remember telling my friend, I was like, "What's wrong with this picture?" He goes, "Why?" Well, I go, "AJ from 106 and Park has this big ass bodyguard, and like Bono's sitting there." <laughs> And nobody's paying attention and nobody's bothering them. And I don't see a security guard with them. I'm sure he had somebody nearby. I just didn't see it. <laughs> just that was one I remember so vividly. And I, I just wish was it Sting or Bono? Because I know I saw them both at Jerry's Deli. The it, this was like the 90, either it was between 97 and 2000 that this was happening. Uh, I don't remember which one, uh, but I that night I don't know which one it was, but it was one of them. And then same thing with that hotel that I stayed at. What the heck was it called? It was 
if anybody been to LA, you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't. It's not the Sofitel, but it's it's right by the Beverly Center, and it had an Asian thing back then, whatever it was. But I so many celebs would stay there. I saw Mike Tyson sitting there one day, all by himself, and then he was. I I think that's when he was shooting the cannabis video when cannabis had the beef with LO Cool J, because I, I saw cannabis there, and I was like, all of a sudden, little couple weeks later, I saw the video come out. I'm assuming that's when they were shooting that video. But I, I didn't. I don't know. But I remember I see him, see him both of them, at that hotel, and not even together, but on the same day I saw him. So in my brain, I put two and two together, and I put that's where Mike Tyson stayed when he shot that cannabis video. I could be wrong, but I did see them both on that day at that hotel. Uh, so God, I used to see all this. I saw Nicholas Cage at that hotel one time, and I was I don't know why I was over there because everybody came in town. They would stay there, and then you you'd meet them there in the lobby and stuff. So, yeah. So that was a that was an interesting story, but anyways, uh, sidetrack. If anybody watched UFC 300 this week, you if you didn't, you missed out. It, it was billed as one of the greatest cards ever, lived up to the hype, but man, the greatest knockout I've ever seen. I don't. I think boxing. Or UFC. That was Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje. That was the greatest knockout I think I've ever seen. And it was just, you got to realize. Knockouts is all about when you do it and how you do it, when you do it. If you're going to say the greatest knockout, it's got to be one punch. It can't be a combination. And somebody's got to be out cold. And the circumstances... So whether you have whether you are a UFC fan or not, I'm gonna paint a picture for you. You got this guy Justin Gaethje. He holds a belt that's only been around for a couple of years called the BMF, stands for Bad Motherfucker. It I I don't know if the if it's if it's with an A or E R, but it should be an A. It should be Bad Motherfucker. It shouldn't be fucker. That doesn't hit that that doesn't hit the same. It should be Bad Motherfucker. So hopefully that's what it is. So he's got this belt. He won it against Dustin Poirier uh, a few months ago. And he knocked Justin Poirier, knocked Dustin Poirier out, right? So who's also a bad motherfucker? Dustin Poirier. And so he gets the belt. He's fighting this guy, Max Holloway. Max Holloway goes up in weight. Justin Gaethje does not have to take this fight. He really has nothing to gain from it. It's not is. You know, because he's the one taking the risk. Because anytime fighters, when they go up in weight, you know, they're always um, viewed as the underdog. So Justin Gaethje was the favorite for this fight. A lot of people was talking about Max Holloway might get hurt in this fight, even though Max Holloway's never been knocked out in his life. And this fight, they just started throwing from round one. And you got to realize UFC is a little different because they might they they might not be throwing hands, but they're throwing leg kicks. And you see these legs just getting swolled up and bruised. And you can tell when somebody's legs are going out. So so Justin Gaethje, his nose gets broken at the end of the first round. So now he can't really breathe out of his nose. A lot of people's nose gets broken. They're done. They're one, one more good punch to the face. They're going down. He fights three rounds, the next three rounds with his broken nose. That's just gushing. Then his face is just getting pieced up, right? On the other end, Justin Gaethje's hitting Holloway with these leg kicks. You can hear him. What tow? What tow? What tow? So his legs are getting all bruised up. But Max Holloway's clearly winning the fight. There's about 10 seconds left in round five, the last round. Max Holloway, all he has to do, fall back, and he's the champ. Or, he, or he's going to take the BMF belt, and he can coast, which most people do, which I would have probably did. This dude, he goes like this and points to the center of the ring, and he's done this before. Points to the center of the ring, let's go. All of a sudden, him and Justin Gaethje start throwing haymakers for nine seconds. Like, they're just swinging. One second left in the fight, Holloway connects. Gaethje goes limp, face first, down, knocked out. One second left in the fight. 
Not the round, the fight. And the guy was winning. He didn't have to do that. Knocked him out cold. They're, they need to show videos. And if, if I don't have a big UFC fan base on my podcast, but if anybody could tag this, the they need to get videos of and spice together different bars all over the country because they they started showing fighters' reactions to this to this knockout. I wish they would show, go go to all the Hooters, the bombshells, the every sports bar out there, and I want to see people's reaction when that happened live because that. I was at I was at my comedy show, and I bought it, and I brought my laptop, and I paused it. So I, my reaction was organic in the moment, but it came probably twenty minutes after it happened, because I got off stage, and then I started watching the fight. When I went on stage, um, the fight was about uh, thirty seconds in. So, anyways, my reaction was organic, but I I, I was like, oh my god. That was unbelievable. And, and side note, not only does that happen, the guy that wraps the belt around Max Holloway, uh, Mark Coleman, his story is unreal. He was he was a former UFC heavyweight champ back in the day when it first started. Uh, a couple months ago, he his dog wakes him up, and he's staying at his mom and dad's house. It's on fire. He pulls his mom and dad out of the fire, saves their lives, and then he goes back in for the dog that that saved everybody's life, couldn't save the dog's life, smoke inhalation, almost dies, comes out of it, and Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje both said, we want Mark Coleman to wrap the belt around us because he's a real bad motherfucker. And I'm like, so the UFC obliges Dana White. They bring Mark Coleman out. He gets to wrap the belt around Max Holloway. And it was just like, I, it's it's why people watch boxing and people watch uh, UFC for moments like that. You, watch Dana White's post-fight press conference. Dana White usually, he's pretty uh, matter-of-fact. He'll have people like, why would you say that? That's, he was so f- fired up and animated and he wanted to talk about that fight. And he said, he goes, I'm in the business of giving people holy shit moments. And that was a holy shit moment. I was just like, God, there's been some, I've seen some great knockouts. But it's never been one like that. It, you got to realize they're, they both are, they both knock people out. They both come and fight the whole fight. They're not one to run. They're not wrestlers. That's a, that's a different art form in itself. You got people like Bo Nickel, um, George St. Pierre, the grapplers, um, Khabib. They're not really like knockout guys. They wrestle you and choke you out and stuff, which is an art form in itself, but ain't nothing. Like people just in there throwing. And then just one second left in the fight? Are you shitting me? For not for the bad motherfucker belt. The BMF belt, which goes to show that's that's what the belt's all about. Oh, oh my God. I was out of breath after watching it. And then they, they, then they both just showed so much respect for each other. And they got these huge bonuses. Like, normally UFC fights, they'll give out $50,000 bonuses. But Dana White said, since it's UFC 300, we're going to give out $300,000 bonuses. So there's four of them. Max Holloway got two of them. He got knockout and he got fight of the night. So he got six hundred thousand. Justin Gates he got three hundred thousand because when you're in fight of the night, it takes two of you. So he got for getting knocked out. He got the three hundred thousand. I'm like, oh my god. I was like, the 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 other two fights, Jamal Hill and Alex Pereira and the the ladies fight. It was like, oh, the wind was kind of taken out of me watching it, and I'm sure the the crowd. How could it not be? How could it not be? I mean, that was a, it was, because you got like a boxing and you got Hagler Hearns. That was a hell of a fight, but Mike Tyson had some vicious one punch knockout. Buster Douglas knocking Mike Tyson out was crazy. Uh, I'm sure Ali knocking out Sonny Liston. Ali knocking out George Foreman. Uh, there's been some knockouts. Never like this. 
One second. One second. And he didn't have to do it. He didn't have to. The way he pointed out the middle of the ring. Now nah, let's go, brother. And then afterwards, there's so much respect to both of them for just, you know, take two to tango. It's a, it was just unreal. And they, you know, Holloway was like, I don't, I don't want to fight him again. I don't go through that. That was a lot. <laughs> I was like, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable, man. God, what a fight. What a fight. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I'll tell you, too, uh, I was watching. And then when you get on the fight, you, there's all the internet trolls out there, right? And then they just, they, internet trolls are the worst because they ruin the moment. Because I go on the internet to, to, to see the highlights, to see people hyping people up over that. But then you got the, Super internet trolls, man. I'm like, I don't know. Kind of, kind of dampens the the moment because you you read it, you don't take it serious, but you still got to deal with it. Uh, so I, I, I can anybody take away anything negative from that is beyond me. You know, uh, it's funny too because I, I think every time I do interviews, right, people are always asking me like, uh, who's your top five comics? We get that a lot. Any podcast I do. Anything, and I've pretty much been consistent with the same five. It's been uh, uh, Pablo Francisco. I'm talking about people just I enjoy watching. I'm not going off ticket sales. I'm not going off popularity. I'm not talking about iconic things. I'm talking about people that I enjoy their stand up, and you, some people might not know them. I always say uh, Mitch Hedberg, Pablo Francisco. Uh, it, you know, we always got Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy. Bernie Mac, but I tell you who's creeping in is Bill Burr to top five because it's not just his stand-up, it's his interviews, the things he said. So when we're talking about internet trolls, it's so funny to me because he went on the Breakfast Club and they were bringing up uh, the Cat Williams interview with Shannon Sharp, how he said... He goes, you know, talk about wearing a dress. And then we he, they talked about, is it true, like, you got to, like, sell your soul or sleep with people? Is it is Hollywood just overrun with things like that? And B- Bill Burr's answer was just so matter of fact. It made so many. He goes, I don't think, I don't think, like, pedophiles or, you know, people like the, the sexual deviants. I don't think it's, it's any more prevalent than it is in plumbing. <laughs> He goes, plumbers got plenty of pedophiles out there. I think any kind of job where there's a bunch of people, you're going to have that. It, it almost like I remember uh, Brian Callen and Brennan Schaub. Uh, I, it's funny how you get to know people and how you get on their radar. My ex-wife got racially profiled on Delta one time. And I'm listen, I, I don't always just jump to conclusions, but – when my daughter and her told me the same story, it's clear that's what happened. And it was, they said, everybody lined up for first class. My my wife and my daughter, I don't think they knew my daughter was with her. They, they, I think my daughter went to bathroom or something. My wife got in line. My ex-wife got in line. It was all white people, all white men. And the ticket agent literally singled her out. They said, ma'am, can I see your ticket? This first class. And she showed him her ticket. And then he went back to behind the counter. And then she she said, I couldn't help myself. I had to ask him. She goes, are you going to ask anybody else? And he was like, no. And she was like, well, why not? He goes, I don't have to. So she was like, well, why would you ask me? He goes, because I wanted to. And she goes, oh. And my daughter, the militant one she is, as soon as I picked my ex up at the airport, she was like, tell him, mom, tell him. So she told me the story. And then my daughter's like, what are you going to do about it, Dad? <laughs> I was like, I'm going to do what white people do. Make a post. <laughs> I'm going to call Delta and tag them. <laughs> but that I made a post on social media, and it, it kind of went everywhere. Well, Brennan Schraub and, and, uh, Brennan Schraub and um, Brian Callen, their Fighter and Kid podcast, they picked it up as News of the Week. And then they said, uh, and, and Brian even said it. He goes, well... You know, Delta's got like 80,000 employees. Your chances are there's a few racist in in that when you got a job force like that. And I go, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's not Delta. Delta's a great, great airline. I love Delta. I love flying them. But you're going to have some bad employees in there. 
And so, like, when Bo- Bill Burr said that about the Cat Williams interview, I said, oh, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. There's a lot There's a lot of studios. There's a lot of execs. There's a lot of producers. Yeah. There's probably a pedophile in there somewhere. There's probably a sexual deviant that's trying to get sexual favors to put people in movies and TV shows and like that. I go, but I don't think it's any different than somebody that works at Amazon. I walk by them Amazon big ass warehouses all the time. I drive by them. You're telling me all those employees, there's not one person with with child porn on his computer. Come on now. So I like, yeah, there's just weirdos out there, and they're in every workforce possible. So yeah, but Bill Burr just made it sound so matter of fact, and I was like, yeah, it's and then what I was talking about internet trolls is like, I go to Twitter to like see what some of the fighters are saying and, and, and everything else. And then you got the internet trolls making dumb shit. Internet trolls are weird because I never meet these people in person. And I know there's bots, but I know some people aren't bots. But I never meet these person people in real life. I never meet. I've literally had people say, if you come to my city, I'm going to walk on stage and smack the shit out of you. I've had people send that to me on social media. It's never happened. And I never see these people. And that's the thing. If you're going to walk on stage to smack me, you got to pay. You you got to pay to see me. You got to buy a ticket. So I'm still winning. And then I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to take whatever you got. So I'm not smacking you back. I'm not going to punch you back. I'm going to take that lick. And I've I've been known to have a decent chin and a hard head. So chances are you're not going to just knock me out. You might you might bust my, my I don't know, might have a black eye or a bloody nose. But chances are you're not going to, uh, you know, my reflexes, I think they're pretty good. You saw it. So you're still going to have to pay to see me. So I'm still winning. <laughs> yeah, I never meet these people. They never, it, never, it never happens. These angry people that go off, I just, when I'm out, people are cool. 90% of people are cool. And it, it reminds me, like Zach Taylor said it, the Cincinnati Bengals coach. He bought, a, he bought a family breakfast last week in Cincinnati. He, he was out. He saw somebody with bingo gear on, and he was like, you know, uh, if uh, he goes, he just felt like buying it. He goes, they support the Bengals, so I just support them. A little breakfast, and he he said, he goes, you know, the reason I did it. He goes, when I'm out in Cincinnati or in public with his family or by himself, whether he's getting coffee or going out to eat, he was like, a hundred percent of the conversations are positive. You don't, it, I get, man, on the internet they will say like, you're the worst coach ever, or even the players like. Man, your ass needs to leave Cincinnati. But when you see these people in public, and I've been around them, I've been with Zach Taylor, I've been with bingo players, people don't do that in person. They never do. It's always like, oh, man, we're a big fan, huge fan. It's so true. Face-to-face contact and face-to-face interaction, people are cool, 90% of them. I just haven't seen these these crazy ones that are always on the internet or they're showing on these clips on social media. I never see it, so. That's just my two cents. So anyways, this weekend, I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. The mailman will be with me, the one mailman. Uh, And then um, next week, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the Improv. So, yeah, check this. uh, If you ever want my tour schedule, it's on GaryOwen.live. And uh, I'll see you guys next week. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast.